I am Kathy Brett with Becker's Healthcare. The program will begin with a presentation and we will have an answer and quest a question and answer session following completion of the presentation. You can submit any questions you have throughout the presentation by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have and will follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address today. You will receive an email within about a week following the webinar that will include instructions for how you can download a copy of the presentation. You will also receive a follow-up email shortly after completion of the program. You can submit your feedback or any additional questions at that time. This email will not include the presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Jeff Leland is the CEO of Blue Chip Surgical Center Partners. Jeff served as Executive Director, Lutheran General Medical Group, a 260-physician multi-specialty medical group located in Chicago. Jeff was once a senior level executive with Advocate Healthcare in Chicago, responsible for both business development and Advocate's 225,000 member health plan. He also served as president of Health Spring Medical Group, a primary care medical group that was acquired by MetLife and Travelers, and as chief executive officer of Western Ohio Healthcare, an HMO with 200,000 plus members which was acquired by United Healthcare. He is an alumnus of the Harvard Business School with an undergraduate studies at the University of Cincinnati. We also have Megan Perry, who is the corporate vice president of Centera Northern Virginia and president of Centera Northern Virginia Medical Center. Megan is responsible for directing Centera's healthcare efforts in Northern Virginia Mark in the Northern Virginia market. From 2007 through 2010, Ms. Perry was Senior Vice President for Business Development, responsible for developing new clinical programs, enhancing business growth, and developing physician collaborations. In 1990, she completed an administrative residency with Centera Healthcare and spent the next 10 years in roles of increasing responsibility, leading various programs at Centera Norfolk General Hospital, which is SNGH, she began her post-residency position as the Director for Women's Services in 1991 and quickly took on a Vice President position working with Emergency Services, Nightingale, and the EVMS Ambulatory Clinics. In 1994, she assumed responsibility for cardiovascular services for the Southside Hospitals and led the cardiac program at SNGH to its first of many appearances in U.S. News and World Report. Ms. Perry earned a master's degree in health administration from Medical College of Virginia in Richmond, a bachelor's degree in managerial economics from Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio, and a bachelor's degree in biology from Davidson College in Davidson, North Carolina. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Jeff Leland to begin today's presentation. Jeff? Thank you, Kathy, and thank you also to uh, Scott Becker for inviting us to participate. And Megan, thank you for joining me in this discussion. Look forward to it. Kathy, could you flip to the next slide, please? Just a, 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 the next one, please. <laughs> Great. This just a quick introduction on Blue Chip Surgical. We're based in Cincinnati, Ohio. We've created about 18 surgery centers. Many are spine-focused, scattered across the country. We've been in business about five years. Four of our projects include hospital partners, and typically our surgery centers generate annual returns in excess of 50%, some consistently 200% return on investment. We're a minority owner in each one of our projects. And um, with that, I'd like to kind of, now that you've given a, have a brief overview of Blue Chip, I'd like to introduce you to Centera Health and um, ask Megan if she could tell you a little bit about Centera Healthcare and and, and the program that she's created. Megan, Great. could you do the next slide? 
Yes, thanks, Jeff. Um, hey, Kathy, if you could uh, sw switch the slides, that'd be great. Um, I just a little bit of background about Centera Healthcare uh, for those that you may not know as much about it. Uh, Centera is largely a uh, Virginia um, health system. We are an integrated health system, and we have historically been primarily located in the Hampton, what we call the Hampton Roads region of Virginia. Uh, just in the past several years, we have expanded to what we call new markets um, in the Harrisonburg area, which you'll see on the map, Charlottesville and Northern Virginia, which is what we'll spend our time talking about today. Just as a background, uh, so now we're at about 10 hospitals across the system uh, with over uh, 3,700 physician partners that we work with in all of our regions. We also have had a long commitment to senior care um, as well as we have a health plan uh, that serves largely, again, the Hampton Roads region as well as the central part of the state. Um, we have grown over the years. One of our, grow one of our goals was to, to grow the company. I've been with the company going on 23 years, and um, we've seen a, a fair amount of growth to get to a, a size that we thought would be um, helpful going forward into uh, health care reform and, and so forth. Um, so if, maybe we could flip the slide and we'll get into a little bit about what we're doing up here in Northern Virginia. Um, we really sought a relationship. Um, I came to Northern Virginia a little uh, less than two years ago. And it was a traditional, we had one traditional hospital in this market, and we were looking for where we were going to go in the future, future with the role of um, population health and how to create more access points. Um, so we had identified some key strategic markets where we're going to look at ambulatory campus development. And one of the one that we're going to highlight today is the one that we've been working with uh, Blue Chip on. And this was a, a market that's about five miles up the road from the base hospital. Um, it's called Satara Lake Ridge. Uh, we did decide to to make this sort of a niche uh, ambulatory campus. It has a freestanding ER along with um, some other strategic partners, and we wanted to make it a musculoskeletal uh, facility. Uh, we decided to make an ASC or to look for an ASC opportunity, um, and, and so we ran out and looked at a JV structure, and that's how we came together with Blue Point. At this point, we have uh, nine uh, physician partners um, that are all orthopedics or spine surgeons. Um, all of them are board members, and they attend monthly. And each partner really brings something unique to the table. Um, as uh, Jeff was mentioning, at this point, Centera and Blue Chip both hold minority stakes in it. Um, and the real estate is actually owned by uh, the MD partners in the, in the building. So the health system actually owns the land and we used a developer to build the building, and then the physicians are owners in the building in addition to being owners in the ASC. It is a very small focus center. It only has, we did relocate one ASC OR uh, that was underused within the health system, and then we did add a procedure room, which down the road, if volume dictates, we could, we did build it to size so that it could be converted to a second OR um, if we can get to that point. Um, could we go to the next slide, please? One of the things when you start to when we started to decide how we were going to move forward is we really wanted to figure out how to partner in this new community in this new region for Centera with our medical staff colleagues and really what we're looking for as particularly a health system is a large health system but one that again is a new entrant to a new market is how do we create a stable medical community and how do we really start to attract top physician talent to want to live in this community and practice here uh, we do find that a number of physicians particularly in the five to ten mile radius around our core facility uh, is, is sort of an aging, it was an aging community, so we really wanted to be able to proactively attract new, uh, the new generation of physicians uh, to the market to be able to um, help us uh, with coverage um, for the facility overall. So we were looking at ways to clinically and economically strategically integrate, and as many of you probably know, that's becoming increasingly difficult uh, with a number of the regulations relative to Stark and compliance. Um, we also wanted to figure out a way that we could manage a CON process. Virginia is a CON state, so the ability to go out and just open up freestanding uh, centers without um, certificate if the public need is very difficult. So this was an easy way for us to take an underutilized resource at, at the core campus and then use it more strategically uh, for advancement for this program. We also are in a very uh, competitive uh, third-party insurance market. Um, pretty much all the big payers are in Northern Virginia, and no one of them has any dominant sort of market share. There, At this point, I think everyone has around 10 to 15 percent of the uh, private pay or of the, of the commercial uh, insurance market. So there is no one sort of dominant player, which in some cases can be quite good, but it does create quite a fragmented uh, third-party market. Um, and then we did want to figure out how we could enhance our whole um, 
uh, musculoskeletal program, not only for the, Im uh, for the ambulatory campus, but also back at the main hospital. Um, next slide, please. One of the things we were looking for when we chose to partner uh, with an ASC uh, uh, organization to help us with this is trying to figure out what our surgeons wanted, and that's where we found um, Blue Chip to be a, a good partner for us because what our physicians were looking for was um, some control um, in, I think, a, a world that they have less control over on a daily basis. They were looking for um, professional satisfaction where they could actually have some uh, say over the environment, over the equipment used, over the staff, and so forth. And they really wanted an, an ability to sort of have the schedule work for them and manage around their sort of work life. Um, Northern Virginia has some real challenges with traffic and transportation, so the ability to, to have uh, some say in terms of the hours of operation and whether we would open perhaps on Saturday hours or have extended hours and those types of things they wanted to be involved in. Um, they also were very concerned about uh, making sure we created an exceptional experience for their patients. Um, I think in today's competitive environment, really being able to to be conveniently located, be on time, and do the things that our patients are asking for us is incredibly important. So they really wanted to be able to have some control over that, if you would. Uh, they want, they're all sort of committed to the excellent outcomes and making sure we meet the functional outcome metrics and so forth that are, that are going to be very much needed as we go to value-based purchasing and so forth going forward. Um, they also wanted it to be very comfortable for the patients, not stressful like sometimes hospital campuses can be with the access to parking and the big, the big OR suites, but to have something that was a little bit more user-friendly um, and nice for them to work it. They wanted it obviously to be productive and efficient, which was, is paramount and we'll, we'll be able to get back to you after a, a couple more months and let you know how we're doing on that. And then of course some economic stability and an ability to sort of have um, have another stream of income as their incomes are coming under uh, fire from the traditional payers. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, what we were looking for as a health system was a way to sort of partner with our surgeons. Again, we are new to the market as a health system, wanted to come in and sort of show the medical community here how we like to work and partner with our physicians. We have a strong history within Centera of um, partnering with our physicians, whether they're through an employment model or through other co-management strategic relationships. So this was a perfect opportunity for us to send out uh, good communication and show the physicians a strong sense of alignment. We also wanted an ability to sort of win back some physicians who had uh, were not as sort of loyal, I guess, to us who had been splitting and going to other hospitals and other markets um, and saying, we'd really love to have you come back and be part of the, the core team. Uh, one of the things we're really working hard on up here is trying to show the lack of productivity in windshield time uh, anytime they're running from site to site. So if we could create a comprehensive center where they could have their offices, they could do their surgeries, and they could stay dedicated to that location for the day, we started, we were able to show them how that's actually going to become a better economic model for them overall. And so this was an ability for us to sort of capture some surgeons back um, that would help us with some co some competitors in the market. Um, we did also want to be able to achieve clinical excellence. That's that's paramount. And we, we really wanted to attract new talent and, and good fellowship trained physicians to the market. And this has been one way to help us with that. Um, we wanted to get a return on our investment. Obviously, we're putting some capital in. We're taking one of our ORs, which is a, a scarce asset. And so we wanted to be sure we got the most out of that for ourselves. And then helping us uh, develop our brand in the Northern Virginia market. Centera is not well known uh, in this market. It's, it's, it's better known in the other parts of Virginia. So this has helped us. And we've already just got a preference study back recently that showed from when we've entered the market several years ago to our current situation, we actually have gained a fair amount of market uh, preference and some market perception. Um, and then we wanted to be able to have the ability to, over time, if need be, we have been partnered with the physicians to uh, figure out how right now they're, they're the, ma the majority owners, but if we need to over time and it needs to flip back to a hospital-based program, we have the ability to do so with the physicians. Um, agreeing to that that model. And we will see how we do with the pricing at this point. Um, the flexibility with the pricing um, model to the third party payers is attractive and we look forward to uh, creating a different, a different model uh, to take to the market as, as times change with the, the third party payers. Um, go to the next slide please. 
So I think when we uh, decided to go this route and with our ambulatory campuses in general, and we'll be looking at several more over the next year or two, is we do think this is the best model for alignment right now with our surgeons. Um, it's, they don't, it, in this market in particular, they're not interested in employment. Um, they are looking for strategic relationships and places that they can partner with us, and this is a great way for us to do that. Um, we did start, I think when you go into these relationships, if I could recommend something, it's very important up front to identify what each, each party wants to get out of it. Um, when we have done other deals and um, other alignment strategies over the years, we used to call it the portfolio of, of, of deals, is that if you don't kind of understand what's going on in the market, if you don't understand what each partner wants to accomplish out of it, they don't end up going well. So we really spent a lot of time really going through the history of the market, trying to understand the com competitive dy dynamics really figuring out what we both wanted to get out of the affiliation, and then based on that, looked at our different affiliation options. Um, so I guess I would encourage as folks look at perhaps this model or others, it's really important to answer those key questions we have listed in terms of everybody's motivation going into the deal, being sure that what we're doing now, because as our environment is rapidly changing, is what we're doing today, how will that look as we, as none of us have a crystal ball, but what will that start to look like um, as the, the economics start to change? Uh, with healthcare reform, and then being sure we're addressing any of the concerns of the physician members in a timely manner, and we're being really upfront and transparent with them about what we can and cannot do. And then really making sure we understand what the benefits are going to be to, to both organizations if we do nothing or if we decide to go forward, and then what the op options may need to be um, as we look out into the future. So with that, Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you, and maybe Great. you can share a little bit about the difference between the traditional multi-specialty model and the, the, the SNCH product. I'll do that. Could you switch, Kathy, please, to the next slide? Megan, thank you for sharing your ideas and your views and your strategy and, and the objectives of Sentara. Thank you for sharing that with the group, and thank you for being a good partner. appreciate it. What, what, what I'd like to do now in the next few slides is share with you some thoughts about, one, the traditional hospital multi-specialty model, and then present to you more fully in some detail the ideas of a niche model where there's highly specialized small surgery centers that we believe, much as Sentara does, that this is a model moving forward that you might want to give some serious thought to. The, the problem with traditional multi-specialty ASCs is, in my opinion, and, and some of these views that I'm going to present may not be fully shared by Megan, but nonetheless, my observation is, is that most multi-specialty hospital surgery centers simply have too many specialties that drives up the capital costs. There's too many owners and too many of the wrong owners. In, in a surgery center with 40 partners, there's sometimes 10 partners who carry the project, 10 that show up when the uh, administrator grabs them by the collar, and 10 that have probably never stepped foot in the surgery center. And quite frankly, I think that that's much of the problem that hospitals have with these multi-specialty surgery centers. Further, the staffing has to be generalist. We think the future is highly focused experts who really understand their, what they're doing from a specialty standpoint. And, and the other point, then, is the return on investment. When 40 doctors own 49% of a project, that, that means that each one probably owns one and a quarter percent. And even though it may generate a 50% ROI for a neurosurgeon, that's $6,500 a year annually, which is basically restaurant money. So we think that the real model moving forward is, is a more specialized one that's more niche focused. Kathy, could you move to the next slide? The, um, the other problems that I think you have with the traditional multi-specialty model is, is commitment and engagement of the owners. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the whole issue of governance, physician leadership, many times in surgery centers that are led by hospitals, the doctors have a role of participating, maybe two or three of them, on the executive committee. But the full complement of surgeon owners are not engaged. They're not well informed. And we think the key to strong performance is physicians that are fully engaged and well informed. Kathy, could you move to the next slide, please? We think that the, the new approach and what Megan is basically implementing and her colleagues at Sentara is, is a network or a niche network of ASCs. We envision a, a, a typical good-sized community or even a moderate-sized community could have a complement of highly focused boutique surgery centers. One, for example, like Megan and her team are creating that's focused on spine and ortho. 
Another could be focused on a be a surgery center for women. Another focused on general surgery, bariatrics. Another pediatric, and the next one, and or excuse me, another one that's of keen interest to um, Centera and Megan's team is one that's focused on ENT. We think what this really allows you to do is, is to create a great patient experience and create an environment where the doctors can really do what they do best. I, I think I could sum it up by saying, I'll ask you, what's the difference between Macy's and Talbot's? I mean, one is a marvelous place where you can pick up just about anything you want, but Talbot's has a tendency to create a more focused approach. Or if you're buying your groceries at Walmart, some folks enjoy shopping at Trader Joe's and, and Whole Foods. So. The real question is, and Kathy, could you flip to the next slide? The real question is, is the, the strength and the benefit of a boutique versus a multi-purpose. You can kind of see where a typical hospital in this slide, what I'm trying to represent here, is that surrounding the, the hospital in various locations, there could be different surgery centers that are focused on specialized niches. One focused on spine and ortho, another on general surgery, another on pediatrics, another on women's health. And this allows you to really create a focused approach that, that permits the doctors to be fully engaged. And if you could flip to the next slide, Kathy. What, what we think is the best model is when physicians are majority owners. I would propose to you that the best model, in the case of the one that we're doing with Sintera, all of us are minority owners. The doctors have less than 51%, Sintera has less than 51%, and Blue Chip has less than 51%. But I would suggest that the best model is one, not where the hospital owns 51% and the doctors own 49 but I would suggest that the best model is one where the hospital has a minority interest and the doctors have a majority interest. The doctors own 51%, the hospital has a minority interest, and there's a corporate partner who's focused on doing what's best for the surgery center and, and brings that expertise to the table. I think that um, a nimble, responsive management team that includes surgeons as active, involved, engaged participants is critical to the success of these projects. And can you imagine, well, many of you know how difficult it is, if you've got 40 doctors to create a nimble, engaged, informed group. But if you have a group of 10 surgeons, it's much easier for them to be engaged and well informed. And furthermore, the facilities can be custom tailored to the specific market niches. One of the points that Megan has, has, has um, constantly brought to my attention is what one of, she wants to obtain by this is creating an opportunity for physicians to be actually participants and to see what it's like to run a joint venture business and to be part of all of that. It's difficult to do when you've got 40 partners. So what we see on the next slide, Kathy, if you could, on the, is that in many instances, hospitals want to own 51%. And that's, that's a legitimate request or sort of a legitimate suggestion. Most are not-for-profits and believe that they have to own 51% in order to preserve their not-for-profit status. Well, we all, we all understand that there are circumstances which that doesn't have to be the case at all. In many of the for-profit hospitals and the large publicly traded ASC management companies, they want to consolidate their financials. So for those reasons, they want 51% as well. I happen to think that works well in principle, but what really works well is when the doctors are fully committed, fully engaged, and most importantly, they walk in and out of that surgery center believing it's their surgery center. They own it. And what happens then when they own it is they become well-informed, they remain engaged. And I found that surgeons make excellent business decisions when they're fully engaged and well-informed. And if, if there is a need for the, for the health system or for the publicly traded ASC management company, to at some point in time own 51%. There's no reason, we've done this in a number of projects, where we embed right at the outset the provision of the right for the hospital to buy majority interest or control at some point in time at fair market value. So there's opportunities to accomplish all of this, but the best way to launch a successful project, in our view, is when the doctors are fully engaged. Kathy, could you flip to the next slide, please? What Sintero is doing in Northern Virginia, in, as Megan outlined, is the 
the uh, doctors are active participants and investors in the real estate. And I happen to think that this is an opportunity for health systems and hospitals to bring their competitive competency to bear. They, they understand buildings. Hospitals understand construction, how to organize real estate. I think there's a marvelous opportunity to create a facility that includes imaging, includes physical therapy, includes a surgery center and physician offices that's tailored to the specific needs of the marketplace and to the surgeons and to the patients and permits the doctors to own a piece of the project. The, the one that, 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 that Centera has launched the project in Northern Virginia with is focused on musculoskeletal. But you can see from the graphic that we could easily have one that's focused and tailored to the needs of women. And at the, at the center of the project is the surgery center for women surrounded by the offices and the other complementary services. So I think this is a real opportunity for a hospital to add value if they look far enough ahead and create that opportunity for the doctors to own a piece of it. Kathy, could you move on to the next one, please? To continue on building the case as to why, I think that um, to create a quality experience for the surgeon and for the patient is much easier. And one can be much more effective if we're highly focused. And I think it's important to do that. On the other side of the coin, the flip side, when we start to talk about this, is the doctors say, well, you know, I'm going to have to drive across town. The surgery center may not be at the end of the uh, cul-de-sac from where they live or nearby the hospital at the moment where they're doing their cases. But I, I suggest to you that if a spine surgeon or an orthopedic surgeon can do seven or ten cases a day with nine or ten minute turn times between cases, minimal downtime, that the productivity is so high and the day can be so productive. Because remember, this is a surgery center that they control. If they aren't happy with the way the OR staff or the post-op staff is moving cases, we change it because it's their surgery center. But when you can offer a highly productive day, remember the surgeons are only there two or three, four days a month. So to drive across town in order to create a better quality experience, in order to, to, to create a return on investment that's quite high, and in order to uh, provide a patient experience that's high, I, I think you'll find that the challenge is, is not what you might think it be when you say I have to drive across town. The other point is patients sometimes have to drive past three surgery centers in order to get to the ENT focus center or the spine focus center, but I will suggest to you, based on my experience in the industry, is that when the surgeon places her hand or his hand on the shoulder of that patient and says, this is where I do my best work, this is where I have the least stress, this is where I get my best outcomes, this is where we're doing the case, the patient has uh, very little reluctance to um, drive across town or past three surgery centers in order to get to that center of excellence where they do their best work. I think the issue of staffing is going to be really important and the ability to implement best practices. If we can create a surgery center where, where the team understands how to move complex cases like cervical fusions and lumbar fusions and they know how to do difficult cases in an outpatient setting, they can be much more effective at what they do, much safer, and the, uh, the overall quality and experience can be much more effective. The other point is is that one of the problems when you've got 40 surgeons in a, in a project is that there's too much dead wood. I mean, there's simply hospitals in general, when you're trying to get a business off the ground, to try and line up every surgeon in town. And I think looking to the future, there, there are some folks that belong in joint ventures that are successful and some don't. And once one joins the project, it's difficult to get rid of them. So the art form, I believe, and what we've done in Northern Virginia is we look to the surgeons to help us decide what other surgeons ought to be included in the mix. And at the end of the day, we end up with folks that add value or complementary and have a keen interest in making the project work. I can show you, and I'll build the case in a few minutes, where financially this is far superior from a return on investment standpoint. But one of the other advantages is what I call, Kathy, if you could change the slide, is the, the board meeting advantage. We, we believe strongly that there ought to be about 10 board meetings a year. We schedule them a year in advance. They last one hour. They start on time. They end on time. And when we recruit a group of doctors to join a project, we tell them that we expect four, three or four elements from you. We expect some cash. We expect your cases. 
We expect a commitment of time, and that means attending board meetings a year in advance that we schedule them. They start on time, they end on time, so that they can get home and they know that they don't have to listen to somebody pontificate for two hours. They can get home and coach a little league game or have dinner with their kids or help a school work. But the real opportunity for the hospital exec and the enlightened CEOs and enlightened hospital executives get it is here's a marvelous opportunity to meet with a collection of doctors, build a relationship with them, exchange information, and it's most important for the doctors to be well informed. If we're running a productive operation with only nine minute turn times between cases, there's no opportunity for the doctors to really understand what's going on from a business standpoint. So at that board meeting, it's critically important for them to understand what's going on with the financials, what's going on with the case, case, case load, the case volume, what's going on with the cash collection, and what's our strategy from a managed care standpoint. So this board meeting turns out to be very important. Most hospitals and health systems with 40 partners will organize an executive committee with two or three doctors that know what's going on, but 37 don't have a clue. And when, it's, when, they, when there's 37 that don't have a clue, you have an unengaged opportunity group of, of, of uh, owners. Could you switch to the next slide, please, Kathy? To go on to, to build the case as to why, uh, Megan mentioned it earlier, but, but to be able to recruit splitters, we think that's really important. To, to build the volume is important. We found in our spine centers that they're very complementary to a hospital spine center of excellence. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the opportunity to attract physicians from across town, if, if we're out recruiting spine surgeons from across town, we suggest to them, hey, you've got the opportunity to invest in a multi-specialty center, the hospital owns 51%, we'll give you the opportunity to own 1.2% and make $6,000 a year. They aren't going to drive across town for that. But if we can show them how they can make Yale money, how they can make $50,000 a year, how they can do nine cases in a day, they'll invest the money to be part of that. But this gives the hospital a marvelous opportunity to create a relationship with them to begin informally talking more and more about what they're doing their inpatient cases and what their, their long-term future is and to change alignment. And uh, we, think it's, it, we think it's a real opportunity for health, health system executives. The other one is, is marketing opportunities. We're fascinated as the marketplace is becoming more retail-oriented and then with, with uh, referral patterns changing, with primary care doctors being more aligned and employed and a few other uh, uh, opportunities centered around the need to, to be more nimble and more better positioned to do direct-to-consumer marketing. We're finding in a couple of our centers, because we only have 10 partners or 9 partners, they'll say to us, we, we need to create an advertising and marketing program that's much more aggressive than what the hospital would do or what the physicians could do on an individual basis. And we end up with a nimble, agile group that is responsive to what's going on in the marketplace. I mean, just imagine trying to convince 40 doctors to come up with an advertising and promotion program. And if you could go to the next slide, Kathy, if you could. The, um, the other point, though, that ties into this is, is positioning for uh, accountable care organizations and bundled payments. If, if you've got a group of 40 doctors and they're presented with the opportunity by United Healthcare or Anthem or Aetna to, uh, to take a bundle, to take a, 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 a fixed price for all the services. Can you imagine trying to explain to a group of 40 doctors what's that all about? Well, we find that when we're talking with our partners and we have the opportunity to take a bundle, because they're well informed, because they're engaged, and because there's a, a dozen of them or more that, that know what's going on, and they're all of the same specialty, they're quick and they're reactive and they're anxious to get involved in some of these new initiatives. And, and they're much more relaxed. If we were to say to them, United Healthcare wants to give us a bundle on um, doing uh, laminectomies and single-level fusions, we aren't trying to run around and explain to the dentist what a single-level fusion is all about. We've got a group of informed, engaged doctors that are anxious to try some of these new techniques. So we think if you want to skate to where the puck is going to be, as Gretzky says, this is the kind of model that allows you to do that because looking to the future, it's the engaged doctors, the informed doctors that are going to help you be much more responsive. The other one, the other point that I've heard Megan say repeatedly 
is she says moving forward, the new, the new hospital metric is not going to be how well I've filled my beds, but it's, it's how few beds I've filled. And as you start thinking about bundles and you start thinking about positioning yourself for ACOs, the old model is, is going to go out the door. So engaged doctors are going to help you be, in my opinion, much more responsive to some of these new contracting opportunities. Kathy, could you change the slide a bit? I, I'm, I put this slide in here to, to make the point that when I talk to my health system friends, they tell me that if they were starting over in a given community, instead of building the 600-bed hospital that was first launched 30 or 40 years ago, instead of building a 600-bed hospital, they would build three 200-bed hospitals. And these are different hospitals that are positioned and organized and arranged to fit the specific needs and allows them to staff accordingly and that sort of thing. So I posit, I put the question in front of you. If niche hospitals represent the future, why not niche ASCs? I contend that large multi-specialty ASCs, like large community hospitals, 600 beds, are make a whole lot of sense when it's a relatively small community with homogeneous and, and uh, general purpose needs. But moving to the future, this whole idea of niche focus we think is going to be important. So the future ought to include an array of surgery centers scattered around the community. Kathy, could you move to the next slide? I put together uh, some financial summaries here. And bear with me on this. There, it, when you get the, the detail, when Kathy mails out the presentation, the appendix includes the specifics behind this. So if you challenge me, I, you'll see all the detail when you get it. But, but the point I'm trying to present here is the financial metrics of a multi-specialty versus, versus an array of niche surgery centers. And I am assuming on the multi-specialty down at the bottom, where it says multi-specialty, that this, this is a multi-specialty surgery center that's four ORs, 18,000 square feet, owned by 40 doctors. 51% is owned by the hospital. 49% is equally owned by 40 doctors. On the niche centers, I'm assuming that the hospital owns 24.5%. A corporate partner such as Blue Chip owns 24.5%, and the doctors own 51%. Again, all the detail is in the appendix and if you have a specific question, we can talk about it in a few minutes. But the key points I want to highlight on this chart are, if you look to the, to the center left under hospital, you'll see that if we did four surgery centers in a community, a spine ortho, a women's, an ENT, and a general slash bariatric, of which the hospital owned 24.5%, and each one was one OR, one procedure room, 7,500 square feet, that the total investment that the hospital places in this for its 24% equity would be about $588,000. The annual annual ROI on each one of those would sum, again, at 24.5% equity, $528,000. So it's a 90% annual return on investment. If you continue down, you'll see that a multi-specialty center, uh, where the hospital owns 51%, 18,000 feet, 40,000, 40 doctors. The, the investment on a cash standpoint for the hospital would be $510,000. The annual ROI, 273. 54% is a marvelous return based on today's standards. But if you look over to the right, you'll see that um, the, op the opportunity for the individual doctors, it becomes a little bit different. A 54% return is not bad, but when you only invest $12,000, you know, the annual, the, the doctor is getting $6,600, and I suggest that that's restaurant money for most surgeons. What you really need is Yale money. You need to be able to put your kids through Yale on what you make on these things. And if you look to the, under the average physician, you'll see that the typical return on investment for each individual doctor, it ranges anywhere from $7,500 on the low end to 44000 annually on the high side. So I can suggest that financially, it makes great sense, in my opinion, for a hospital to invest in this and support this to create this opportunity for surgeons. And furthermore, I think you build stronger physician bonds by doing it by doing it this way, and you tailor the experience more for the patients. Kathy, could you move on the next slide, please? I'd like to just comment, if I could, on the um, on, on a bit of a proof, a bit of um, a, a 
testimonial to the fact or, or whatever. We, we have a, a small surgery center, one OR, one procedure room, 7,000 7, square feet in Hagerstown, Maryland. It's been in operation about three or four years now. We've consistently generated annual returns to each part or monthly returns to each partner on an $80,000 investment of anywhere from ten dollars to $25,000 per month per partner. So it's been a marvelous investment for us and for, for our partners. When we first launched this project, it was absolutely viewed as, viewed as a threat by the hospital. And the uh, hospital was angry and reacted strongly. And, and interestingly, about six or seven months ago, I was speaking with the CFO. We, we've actually now become friendly with one another. And the CEO's direct quote was, five years later, looking at two years' data before the surgery center and three years after, I can tell you that, that Jeff, this ASC turned out to be no threat at all. Actually, it was helpful to the hospital. What they found is the neuro revenue has increased gigantically. And it's primarily as a result of expanded capacity that created the opportunity for higher acuity cases. The, the doctors created a, a patient experience that was favorably viewed, helped them grow market share. They're actually attracting patients from a much larger region. And there's much less leakage, both from the surgery center opportunity, but the leakage that was leaking out to other communities for inpatient work. As a result, the neuro revenue, and we have four neurosurgeon partners in this project, the neuro revenue at the hospital was significantly higher than it was before the project was launched. So the hospital CFO concluded that at the end of the day, he wished he had gotten involved in the project and supported its development sooner. And the next slide, please, Kathy, if you could. We, um, we've done this on four or five projects and uh, spine only musculoskeletal like we're doing with Sintera. And I can tell you that the numbers are consistent. We can generate the numbers we said we would. The proof is here. And, um, and with that, I'd like to go to the next slide and take any questions that you may have. Is this the right time, Kathy, to do this? Okay, well, thank you, um, Jeff and Megan, for your very informative and enjoyable presentation. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the program. And as a reminder, you can submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled Enter a Question for Staff and clicking Send. I see we have some questions already. Our presenters will attempt to answer as many questions as they can during the time we have for Q&A, and will follow up on questions they do not have the opportunity to address today. Um, I'm going to take this first question. Um, is this niche network strategy more difficult in a CON state because of the regulatory hurdles? Megan, do you want to take a shot at that, or do you want me to? Um, I, would, I, I guess we'll go ahead. Why don't you take it from your perspective, Jeff, and then I'll take it from mine. Well, I, we most of our projects are, are not in CON states. So I don't have, I haven't developed 16 or 20 surgery centers in CON states, and every state varies a bit. But the limit, the experience that I do have suggests that it's, it's a smaller center is much easier to launch. It, it involves much less um, scrutiny of the competition, and it's much easier, I believe, to demonstrate the need and to craft the data that supports the idea that it's a logical investment. Right, yeah, Megan? I would I would concur with that. I think that uh, I think that Jeff would tell you that uh, the for blue chip to go into a CO to go into a CON state, um, it, it clearly makes it easier for them and the physicians to have a hospital or health system partner. I think trying in a number of the CON states, obviously trying to go to uh, the state and request an OR with just the physicians and a blue chip as owners would be a little more challenging. I think when you could go in with the health system as a partner to show how it fits into the broader community needs and the broader the broader broader uh, service delivery um, is a better strategy. And obviously, I think there's the other opportunity for health systems and hospitals to look at their current capacity and their current inventory of operating suites and decide, it does it make sense to dedicate one to one of these niche plays as a way to sort of grow the entire enterprise? OK, great. Thank you. Um, just wanted to mention to you both that there are a lot of questions coming in from attendees. And I will take this next question right now. Is a CON 
for one OR less or more difficult to obtain than a CON for a four OR surgery center? Ooh, Kathy, I think we kind of touched on that on the first one. Um, oh, I, I, okay. No, that's Let okay. My, I, I just think that to, to reiterate a point, I, I believe that it's easier to demonstrate need and it's 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 opposed less frequently or um, strongly by competing systems if it's only one OR. Got it. Okay. Um, well, then let's move on to this next question that we have here. How do you justify the construction expense of four boutique centers at a 7,500 square foot versus one ASD at 20,000 square feet? Good question. Um, if, if I was going to do the math on that, I guess four times 7,500 would be the cost of a 30,000 square foot complex versus a 20,000. My answer to that would be it's driven off the merits of the investment. If I can show that the investment will generate a return that's in excess of 100% or in excess of 60% and it holds together, I would just as soon move forward with that than one that generates a 50% return on investment. I think, and, and by the way, that's a cash on cash. I think that was, I'm, I'm scanning through some of the questions that we're asking. The return on investment is based on return on cash versus cash. But back to the, uh, to the, to the four, the cost of four, I think that for the convenience of a hospital or a health system, it might be easier to do one OR, or excuse me, one multi-specialty center and rationalize that that's the best low-cost investment, but, but when you look at eliminating dead wood and being more productive, I think the return on investment opportunity of the niche makes more sense, even though there's more square footage in total. Yeah, I would add, the only thing I would add to that, I think the other benefit, and I, I, I would, I, we don't know yet, I would argue that we, I don't know if one is probably quite as efficient, two will probably be perfect um, as we build the volumes, but you match, I think, the size of the niche center with the number of physicians, and I think we were very careful in ours not to over, overextend and have more physicians involved than we thought we could service. I think it's important, if you can make them incredibly efficient, some of the broader multi-specialty centers end up sitting on a lot of excess capacity. Um, they kind of over, are overbuilt, and they don't usually get. They, it's hard to keep all four ORs running without a huge number invest, of investors. So I think there's there's probably where the sweet spot is, and my guess is probably the sweet spot is about two. Um, I think one with a procedure room is we're heading. We'd like to head to two. Is that fair, Jeff? Yep, I agree. I agree. Well, most of, most of them will build. We we say it's one OR and one procedure room, but what we actually have is two ORs, but we only fit them out initially as a procedure room, we'll plummet for two ORs, and then as the need develops, we'll do that. But it's also driven by the difficulty in getting a CON. It may be more difficult to get the CON for two ORs than one, so we'd much rather get the one OR and then go back and, and ask for approval to add another OR at a later date. Kathy, is there another question? Yes, there are. Um, do you lose leverage in managed care negotiations because of multiple smaller facilities versus one large entity? No. No. I, I, I could actually build the case that when we talk to health plans about our highly focused approach, the efficiency, the fact that we eliminated some of the very dead wood investors as far as surgeon goes, surgeons are also the, the very ones that, that don't utilize services well or overutilize and the health plans seem to be very responsive when we present this concept. Great, thank you. Um, Jeff, here's a, a question um, from an attendee. What factors would one need to consider when looking at a spine ortho ASC versus a spine ortho hospital with inpatient beds? Oh my, well, cost. I mean, Megan will tell yeah. you that looking to the future, as we start as we start to take bundled contracts and we start to worry more about the, the, the ORs as, a, as an expense versus a, a revenue generator, you're going to want to go to the lowest cost setting. We can run a one OR surgery center that's doing cervical fusions, laminectomies, disectomies, lumbar fusions much more cost effectively than you can run a hospital. Now, we can't we can't take on all the patients, but, but it's a niche that we can serve and serve well. Um, 
I don't yeah, I, I would tend I would tend to agree with Jeff. I think what what we've all got to get prepared for from a from a hospital, an old-fashioned hospital administrator perspective, is the reality that you know no no longer is inpatient sort of market share and sort of bed is is market share going to be what we want. We're really going to have to start thinking about more efficient models and ways to do um, more stuff in an ambulatory setting with maybe some observation and home health and other kinds of ways to to manage that versus laying in a, coming into a, a very expensive infrastructure like a hospital hospital and um, adding, you know, there's a lot of expense. Now, clearly, there are patients that will continue to require that, but we, we see that as a shrinking, a shrinking percentage of our mix. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have time for a few more questions here. With considerable ASC competition in my market, could it make sense for us to acquire existing ASCs and resyndicate slash rebrand these facilities into a niche approach? Oh, it's an intru we, we're doing this in a number of communities. There, I mean, ASCs really became popular maybe 10 or 12, 15 years ago, and they're now at the point where some are underperforming and underutilized. And what, what I think a health system could easily do, instead of building and constructing new sites where it doesn't have to be focused towards a specific niche, like a women health surgery center for women, what we could do for an ENT surgery center is, is we could, a, 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 an underutilized, poorly performing surgery center could be acquired and, and reconfigure modern, you know, improvements and uh, bring it up to speed. And the, the cost of entry, the cost of cap of, of, of building and constructing is significantly reduced. So I would think that that would be a marvelous strategy. Good question. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, this next question, are hospital-employed physicians excluded from participating in these projects? Oh, Megan, you'd probably be better at answering that than me. I'm sorry, could you repeat? I, I missed the first part of that question, Kathy. Are, sure. Are hospital-employed physicians excluded oh. from participating in these projects? That probably varies from um, health system to health system. Um, it, it currently, before we don't have, we do not have, we have a very small um, employed medical group currently in Northern Virginia. Um, I, we have a larger medical group in Hampton Roads, and I do not believe, I believe our our medical group uh, surgeons are are allowed to participate. That's been our historical philosophy. I, I, I had, would have to check and see if anything has changed. I think Megan is right, and there's significant variation across the. Uh, we have no, I can't think of a single project where employed surgeons have come to us and asked to be an owner and followed through with it. On the other side of the coin, we have some projects that include employed surgeons, but they were independent at the outset and then later became employed. I think it, it varies significantly health system to health system, community to community. Do you have another question, Kathy? I do. Um, this attendee asks, we are a multi-specialty facility in the Kansas City area. If the opportunity would arise to split these centers into single specialty, does the model require separate entities with separate licenses, or could they be combined under one license? Um, I from my own experience, the answer is that you, you'd want them to be separately licensed, separately owned. Now, I, I don't mean to create a complicated answer, but we have one surgery center that is licensed. It, it's two centers at the same address. They're separately licensed, separately accredited. Uh, it gets very complicated to do that, and it varies by state. But I think the simple answer is they have to be separately licensed separately owned. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, this attendee asks, what about the ASC centers that perform the less profitable procedures, such as OPPO and GI procedures? Do they fit in the niche strategy? Oh, sure. I think and, so. And yeah. I'm not, I, I don't know about Megan, but I'd be quick to say they don't have to be unprofitable. If, if you organize them well and you manage them well, I mean, I could. There's. I mean, we do extremely well on I and GI mm -hmm. uh, if they're managed well. 
Yeah, I think those are those are a little different, and I think the the mix in the ortho and some of the other specialties Jeff has mentioned uh, tend to be a little longer cases. So obviously the the reimbursement and the, the margin per case is a little bit higher. But I think on those it's more it's larger. It's more of a volume efficiency play, and I think you can make it up on being incredibly efficient and very successful. The patients get a wonderful experience. It can be very much high touch, high volume. Kathy, I'd like to to thank Megan for participating in this. And again, thank you for being a good partner, Megan. And Kathy, thank you for inviting us. This, is, this has been interesting and fun. Well, yes, I want to thank you both for your excellent presentation and for all the attendees who participated today. We look forward to having you join us again for future webinars. This will conclude today's program, and have a wonderful afternoon.